Um, thank you for having me along this evening. I'm going to show you my sketching methodology. And hopefully what will come across is why I enjoy in this day and age of digital cameras, of image processing, and even people are processing data captured from spacecraft around Mars or the Hubble telescope data, why there's a certain pleasure in just enjoying and looking at objects in the distant universe. And how I find it, you know, quite calming, it's good for the soul, particularly as we were at work all day long, um, stuck in front of computers. It's sometimes quite nice just to go and remind ourselves of the of the natural world around us. Now, if I if you do lose me again or things aren't clear, feel free to jump in and, and ask a question. And I must admit to finding it strange talking to an empty screen, certainly compared to us being together in a room. And I think I guess that's how teachers must feel nowadays, just speaking to an empty microphone. And I'm just worried now you've all sneaked off, gone to watch telly, have dinner, and you're just going to leave me talking here by myself. The only good thing about this, so I guess, is if you're all muted, you can heckle as much as you want and I won't even know about it. Right, so let's go into the talk then. So here's some sketches I've done in the background. And this is what my wife likes to call Mark's dot to dots and smudges. And she used to always laugh because it was funny when the kids were small. And if I'd been out observing, if we had a good night like we did last night, and I would get my sketching kit books out the next day and finish up my sketches and write up my notes. And the two children would come and sit alongside me and we'd all be doing our colouring in together uh, at the weekends on the table. And she used to think it was quite funny. So she used to call it Mark's Dot to Dots and Smudges. So by way of introduction, I started observing, and it feels a disappointingly long time ago now, when Comet Hayakitaki went past in 1996. And I was actually spent my gap here after I left school and before I went to university working in Canada. So when I hear people moaning about how cold it was last night because it went down to, oh my goodness, minus five degrees C, having observed for a year and lived for a year in Canada, I can assure you minus five is not particularly cold. And there we are, that date there is Sunday the 25th of March, which is my first proper observation I made, uh, astronomical observation. And just above it, you've got, an, unfortunately, a major snowstorm has struck, preventing observations of Comet H. We need clear skies. So, um, and I've always enjoyed that sort of visual, the visual approach and, and being able to see these objects firsthand. And I say last night was positively tropical compared to Canada in the middle of winter. So this is me now. I've got a Celestron C11 in a roll-off roof observatory on the on a village near Salisbury. And I try and keep myself to be sort of a bit of a generalist. I don't really have a speciality. I enjoy following variable stars. I do visual uh, estimates of variable stars and send them to the BAA. I enjoy deep sky observing and I'm really getting into imaging the moon and the planets. Um, not that we've had many planets around apart from Mars recently. So whatever happens, I've always got my notebook with me. Even if we go on holiday with a pair of binoculars, I'll have my notebook and my camera with me um, and that sketching kit with me. And there's something very calming I find about the simplicity and that sort of personal experience. You actually get to see, see things as well. But before we get into the detail, I'm just going to have a little diversion off into the deep sky names. So deep sky objects have a variety of names. And they're named after, well, the first bunch are the Messier, the M numbers. These are named after Monsieur Messier, who was a French astronomer in the 1700s, and he would hunt for comets. And he used to be paid a salary. He was an astronomer in Paris. And it was his job to go out and look for these comets and scan back and forth. And he kept on stumbling across faint, fuzzy things that looked like they could be comets, but they never moved against the background stars. So he put a catalogue together and he consolidated uh, deep sky objects from other astronomers as well. And uh, he, they named them after motorways. So you have M1, M25, M4, M8, M3. Um, but I certainly thought they were named after motorways, but they're, they're named after Monsieur Messier. And interestingly, when Messier was an old man in the 1800s or late 1700s, William Herschel, who was a German astronomer, um, relocated to, to Britain. You can imagine that in this day and age, a German coming to live in Britain. And he set up his observatory in Bath and he was a prolific astronomer and he would survey the night skies with an ever increasing uh, aperture size telescope 
and was literally where Messier got to 100 objects, a number are added to his catalogue posthumously. Uh, William Herschel himself, as well as discovering a new planet, uh, moons around Saturn and numerous objects, he, he actually discovered over 2,500 new deep sky objects every night. And that's from England, which I find incredible considering the weather we get. Uh, now, Herschel and then his son consolidated their discoveries. A number of others were discovered, uh, put together into the new general catalogue. And we call it the NGC, even though it's yeah, a couple of hundred years old now. So I'll refer to objects as M. Uh, um, so we'll, we'll have various M objects that we'll talk about. M31, for example, being the Andromeda Galaxy and NGC, new general catalogue. And if you're interested, there's a whole load of other catalogues that people have put together as well, Colander, Arp, Abel, Hicks, and they're more specialists, so I won't go into those now, but they're just there for, for interest. Let's get my notes ready. So what I'll do then, I'll talk about how I go about preparing an observing list of what I want to go and look at in the sky, the equipment I have, how we go through an observation, and then how I go about drawing it as well. So let's move on to the first thing, which is preparing an observing list. So the problem with the observable universe is that there's an awful lot to go out and see. Even with a small telescope, with a pair of binoculars, uh, with a camera, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of objects we can go out and see. And there is a risk of repeatedly observing the same things over and over again, returning to our same familiar objects. And that's a bit of a shame because there are so many fantastic sites that you, you would miss. And what I have done is I followed, uh, when I was studying astronomy, I, I started following the Messier list and I ticked off the 110 objects uh, that make up that list, albeit some of them are, are, are mistakes in the catalogue. Uh, I'm now midway through the Herschel 400 program, which is the 400 best and brightest from Mr. Herschel's two and a half thousand. And I also read through the astronomy magazines, follow various forums, the PAA have a deep sky section and the web deep sky society also have a, a section as well. And I keep a list, I literally just keep it on my phone of um, people writing interesting observing reports or as an interesting picture appears in, in, in an article or a, or a forum post and keep this on my phone. And then that gives me a list of what I could go out to, and, and look at. And I also, uh, draw inspiration from this old thing. I, uh, some people, um, some of the younger members may not have heard of it, but they're, they're called books. And the people write books of, of things of what to go and look at in the night sky. Um, this book I thoroughly recommend, Stephen O'Meara's Herschel 400 Observing Guide. And I've had this for a few years. I slowly go and try and work my way through the 400 objects. But he gives you a season by season, night by night, week by week guide of what's the best time of year and what these things actually look like. And it gives you a nice structure so you don't spend a lot of time star hopping. Uh, you, you can actually move quickly around from object to object. I've also bought these three books as well, Burnham's Celestial Handbooks. They're kind of dated now because they're about, uh, I think they're published in the 70s. So they're quite old in terms of the science behind them, but the observing guides and the notes that go with them are absolutely first rate, really nice books to read through. And they're divided into constellations. So you can just think, well, Orion's nice place, nicely placed at the moment. And you can go through there and find interesting objects to go and have a look at. Great for, great for observers. And I got this in the olden days when you're allowed to go and travel. Um, I put these in, bought these in Hay on Y for 20 pounds for the three of them. Uh, so yes, yeah, so if you ever get the chance to go and visit um, secondhand bookshops, always have a look around and see if you can find some uh, interesting observing guides. My other recommendation is these uh, books, the Night Sky Observer's Guide. I've got volume one, two, and four. Volume three is the Southern Skies, which we don't really get to see very much of from England, um, or certainly from the Northern Hemisphere. So I, I skipped over that one. And again, they've got a really nice um, feel to them. And again, divide the sky up into, into constellations and describe all the interesting objects you can see in you know, binoculars, small telescopes, medium telescopes, light buckets. And then from that, again, you can prepare interesting lists of things to go and have a look at. Uh, unfortunately, the publisher, Wilman Bell, went out of business or he retired anyway, before just before Christmas. 
but they're looking, or at least the rumor control on cloudy nights, that they're getting a new publisher lined up. But if you ever see these for sale on the secondhand forums or you see them in the bookshop, do snap them up. They're real, really nice books to have and flick through as well. And just look at the size of these these books. Uh, it gives you an idea of how many things there are in the night sky apart from the Orion Nebula, the Pleiades, the Andromeda Galaxy. Loads of really interesting things to go and hunt down. So that's how I go about preparing an observing list. We'll move on to the next section now, which is the equipment. So just have a little diversion. Just having said how much I enjoy having books, I've bought um, Sky Safari. I just realized Sky Safari is hidden behind the picture there. And it's a app you put on the, on, well, in my case, on the iPad. And I've downloaded the Herschel 400 objects and I put them on there. So last night, for example, I was working my way through Orion and Monoceros. And uh, so this is the Mono so this is all the objects in Monoceros that are in the Herschel 400. And you can see, you can find yourself a nice little route to, to sort of pl plug your way through. It feels a bit like a pub crawl or, or, a, or a deep sky object crawl as you work your way through the, through the stars. And then jumped across to Orion as well and had a great time hunting through things. So although I did, I must admit, I did digress into the Orion Nebula and who, who would not do that? Uh, but, the, you know, lots of interesting things you can see around uh, in this. And I'm just going to have a little highlight. One of my favourite open clusters is this one right up at the top, NGC 2169. Uh, and I don't know if you've heard of that one. But it's sometimes nicknamed the 37 cluster. So that's a little sketch I did. I haven't finished this sketch yet at all, uh, but that's the how it appears in, in the eyepiece. And you've got this backwards three and what looks like a seven. Uh, and hence it's nicknamed the 37 cluster. So I really recommend Sky Safari. It's a really nice uh, application to use. So I control my C11 mount on, on this as well, and then have the planetarium display that goes alongside it. In addition to Sky Safari, I've got the Pocket Sky Atlas on the left. And what that is, of course, it's, it's an old traditional paper star chart. And I use that when I'm using my binoculars or we're on holiday or a small telescope. It's a really good size. It literally is a, I know you can buy the jumbo one now, but it literally does fit into a large pocket. And I've say, you can see mine's a few years old there. It's absolutely battered on the cover. But inside, because it's printed on laminated um, sort of G-proof paper. It's as good as the day it was printed. Uh, so I really recommend the Pocket Sky Atlas. Um, it's just the right sort of detail for binoculars and small telescopes. The other thing I recommend as well for observing is a small red. Now I got told off when I was this in America, Shane, you can't call them a torch because if you say torch, they think you, you're holding a flaming stick like in a medieval film. So yeah, it's a flashlight, a dim red flashlight. <laughs> And uh, yeah, my confusion among when I first moved to the UK <laughs> very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you thought it was like a medieval film, everyone wandering around with blazing torches. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So the problem is, of course, when you're looking at your notes or your star charts or you're swapping an eyepiece over, you need some light to see what you're doing. And if you have a, a, a bright light, of course, that affects your night vision. And of course, these deep sky objects are so faint. So having a, a, a red flashlight, you can adjust the brightness. You've got that little wheel in the center uh, is, is well recommended. And I also have my old school um, pencil case as well. And I say that just lives with my, uh, in my, in my little case that I use for my observing kit. And I put this little folder together, oh, a good few years ago. And I bought an A5 folder and I bought some of that plastic laminate, sticky laminate stuff that, you know, children put on their school exercise books. Uh, so that keeps all the dew and uh, whatnot off. And then I bought those metal pencil clips uh, and they're sold on eBay for, you know, nurses or engineers or what have you, people who need to put pencils in their top pockets and don't want them falling out. And that's really useful because it means I can keep my, what I'm working on is effectively on that clipboard. I tuck it in underneath the, under the metal clips and under that bulldog clip. And then now it's a bit like having an artist's easel. I've got my propelling pencils, my sketching pencils, blending stamps, eraser, it's all to hand. And you, when it's in the dark and you put them in this pocket, do I put them in that pocket? Have I left them on the, you know, on the mount tray? But having them all in those little metal holders is really useful. You've got everything to hand then. The other thing I recommend as well is getting some decent paper. I've, when I first started off, I just used a school exercise book. 
Uh, that was the first notes I had back in Comet Haikataki. But I've started now buying proper sketchbooks from the art shop. And I wasn't going to, we've got in Salisbury a shop called The Works, which is one of those discount bookshops. Where every, you know, everything's at 25%, everything must go, clearance sale, everything gone. Uh, and they're a real great stores for you know buying this. These are, these are a couple of pounds each uh, for 100 pages of decent art quality paper. So buying sketchbooks from from a sort of a discount retailer is, is well recommended. And so this is what I take out with me. These are my main sort of uh, observing in instruments. So on the left, then you've got the propelling pencil. So it's nice and always sharp, and I use that for recording the stars. So you get nice points. I've got a blending stump, which you smudge the nebulosity, use that to blend the nebulosity together. I've got a, an eraser that comes out of that pencil as well, so it's always sharp and always clean. And then a hard pencil and a soft HP pencil as well that goes with it. For again, if I want to do thicker nebul nebulosity or fainter. And then just a large generic eraser as well at the bottom. And the metal thing, the metal tray-like thing at the bottom is, is a, an erasing shield. And then you can see there you've got different sized holes, different slots, different things. And then, so if you're doing a busy star field and you realize you put a star in the wrong place, you don't want to rub everything out around it. You can put that over it and then just erase the the area of concern on the on the sketch you've drawn. And again, these are only a pound or two, if that, on eBay, Amazon, whatever, WH Smith, when they, when, if they're open still. Um, and I also use the horizontal strips here. And I will come onto that as well for sketching you know, when you're marking dust lanes into galaxies. So you can then apply nebulosity with a pencil, you can blend it with the blending stamp, and then you can erase a dust lane uh, in as well by using that shield without having to lose everything. So that's the observing equipment then. We've talked about getting an observing list prepared and sources of information both online and in the traditional paper format. Uh, we talked briefly about star charts there and so I recommend Sky Safari and the Pocket Star Atlas. We talked about the sketching kit and I say that little pencil case and the folder that comes with me. Uh, dim red torch and just to highlight a dim red torch, you know, if, you, if you've got a one of those big bright red uh, headlights on, they're probably going to be a bit too bright. And one of the other things I realised many moons ago when we used to go up onto Salisbury Plain and go go observing, uh, we used to do sort of multi-hour uh, observing trips from I don't know, eight o'clock at night through to maybe the small hours in the morning, is how important comfort is. Um, and certainly last night, you know, if you're uncomfortable, you're not going to get the best out of it. So I used to joke that we used to put a whole load of warm, you know, winter clothing, you know, extra tracksuit, trousers, down jacket, gloves, hat, scarf, all that sort of thing. And I used to put enough out that looked ridiculous. But it wouldn't be enough. You'd always have to put more out. So do take lots of warm clothing, take a chair to sit on so it's more comfortable, take refreshments, have a flask of tea or snacks as well. And then inevitably, even, you know, when you go to a, a relatively dark sky, there's always some light pollution, some street light summer, some farm lights. So having a hoodie, not only does it, the, having the hood up over your head, keep your head that little bit warmer by cutting the wind off. It also blocks off stray light as well from coming into your into your peripheral vision. So that's my sort of generic observing equipment list. So let's get into the actual observation section of the talk as well. I'm just going to have a little segue off again into some sort of general tips about observing these sort of faint objects. So the problem is, as we were saying, that these objects really are intrinsically faint. I know when you look at pictures or an image of them that they, you've got all the beautiful dust lanes and spiral arms in the galaxy. But of course, that's a multiple minute, multiple hour sometimes exposure. And your your eyes just simply can't cope with that, you know, that sort of, that, those sort of dim lights. So you really want to cut down on the background light as much as you can. So to get the best out of observing these faint fuzzies, these deep sky objects, try and avoid the moon. Of course, if the moon's up and you want to have a look at deep sky objects, it's just not going to be as good. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it but uh, the, the moon is a source of light pollution. Try and get away from the city lights if you can. Um, I'm still looking forward to one day lights of visiting somewhere like the Australian light back, uh, Australian outback, or going out to the Atacama Desert, somewhere where the nearest street light is over the horizon. And of course, observing objects on the meridian. So when they're at the highest, when they're due south, 
obviously the higher up and out of all the dust and water vapor and pollution that's in the atmosphere uh, the higher the objects are in the sky when they're due south then the better they are to see and one of the things that soon becomes apparent when you walk outside in a lovely clear sky you think oh the sky's not that good I think, oh, hang on, no, it's just because my eyes aren't used to walking out from a brightly lit house out into the garden. You've got to allow your eyes to become dark adapted to get used to the, the, that sky. And it can take about 45 minutes to get your full dark adapt that adaptation. And when you're in that stage, you'll suddenly find that, you know, all these subtle things that you completely missed before uh, in deep sky objects and in your own surroundings suddenly become quite obvious. It's normally at this point, about an hour or two later, I think, oh, I really could do with a cup of tea. I'm going to have to go back in the house. And I know all the lights will be on and the telly will be on as well. So I block my right eye. I pull my woolly hat down over my right eye and put my hand over it. And that old soldier, old army technique that keeps one eye by keeping it shut helps preserve some of that uh, uh, dark vision, that night vision you've got there. And the final thing is when you're looking at these faint objects, if you look directly at faint nebulosity, it can disappear. And it's the way the rods and the cones, the nerve cells in your eyes are set up. So sometimes looking out of the corner of your eye, a process called averted vision can bring out some sort of faint details that you can't see when you look directly at them. And of course, if that doesn't work, there's another thing which is called averted imagination, where you just say you can see it, uh, whether you can see it or not. So let's get into the process, the actual mechanics end of making a sketch. Now we're coming up to spring galaxy time. The, certainly last night, you could see Orion setting at about midnight and Leo was coming up on the, on the eastern side. And then behind Leo, of course, you've got Virgo and Coma and Ursa Major. So all those springtime galaxies are, are coming around again as the winter sky starts disappearing. And one of my favorites is this lovely thin edge on, on galaxy. And um, thanks to Dave Shavel for the picture. He said he actually photographed this through thin cloud, which is pretty amazing. But you can see there, you've got this beautiful sort of needle uh, galaxy, you've got a thin dust layer, and you've got the galactic bulge in there. And reading about it online then, so this was discovered by William Herschel back in the day, one of his two and a half thousand objects. It's 40 million light years away, a member of the Coma group of galaxies, and it's well placed at this time of year. It's pretty bright, magnitude nine, so should be visible in small telescopes. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be visible in binoculars or a finder scope, but I'm sure from a suitable dark sky site, I'm sure someone has seen it. And uh, this is the sketch I made uh, about this time last year, in 25th of March last year uh, with the C11. And what I'll do is I'll talk you through the mechanics of how I put the sketch. Now, what I didn't do, of course, was break it down to stages. So I've had to do some Photoshop trickery just to sort of break it down into how I put the sketch together. And we'll do that now. So the first thing I do when I'm making a sketch is obviously you've got to find the object, get it into the eyepiece. But I always take a few minutes to then relax. This light's traveled across the, you know, 40 million years. So, you know, just after the dinosaurs had gone extinct, that light set off across the universe. So I'm in no particular rush to, I've got, you know, to, to get pencil to paper and start drawing straight away. It's really nice just to let your eyes adapt, get that final bit of night vision into place. Place the object in the center of the field of view, and then think about all those photons that have traveled for those millions of years. And if you blink, they're just wasted on your eyelids. But if you open your eyes, you actually get to see the, the photons there. So note the dates, the time, what instrument you're using, what magnification, your start time. Because of course, when you come back to your notes in months, years to come, of course, if you haven't written that down, you wouldn't know when you made it. The first thing I'm going to do then is put on what I call my framework style. So if I want to sketch this, this lovely edge on galaxy, I need to build up a framework of stars that sort of give me the finer and finer details. This is a bit like doing the outline of a drawing and then adding finer and finer details. So I've selected this star here at the bottom and that's going to be my sort of center point. I know my 12 o'clock is straight up. And I notice that there's a star. Now I'm imagining if I'm looking through the eyepiece that I'm holding a piece of paper, it's, you know, whatever, a foot or 18 inches away, whatever, you sort of hold a piece of paper to read and write. And I've got to transport, transpose that field of view from the eyepiece onto this piece of paper. So I put my star there in the center, slightly towards the lower part of the sketch. 
and I'm looking at, and I use a lot of lefts and rights and ups and downs. So if I follow this line across, it's sl just a smidge below, and I'm guesstimating an inch or two, a couple of inches uh, on the left-hand side. Now, roughly the same distance again, maybe a bit more, but and a little bit further out to the left is another star, a little bit fainter. So I'm recording my bright stars with a thicker, wider diameter dot, and fainter stars have then become thinner. So I've got these three stars around, form a, you know, nearly a right angle triangle, but not quite. And I've also noticed there's a fourth faint star that's slightly up and to the right. Ignore all the smudges and the errors that come with it. And again, it's a little bit higher than the top star and a little bit further out. And I've now got this sort of trapezium, whatever you call it, four-sided shape, irregular shape there. And I'm thinking, well, I can now start adding in the galaxy core because I know it's a little bit to the left. The center of the galaxy is a little bit down and to the left at 45 degrees, roughly at the same height as this star. So again, I'm using this grid. So I'm using my up, down, left, right. And I'm just going to use that HP pencil on the smudging stick just to roughly mark in which what direction that, that core of the galaxy is. So I've just you've got a placeholder, if you like, at that point. Now I've got the framework stars and I've got the sort of galaxy core marked in. I'm going to add in some of these fainter stars. So I've got this little arc of stars here. And I'm just following the same process again. This star's a little bit further out and down. This star's a little bit higher up, maybe a little bit higher than the fourth, the fourth framework star over there. Follow this arc, follow this round. Again, up, down, left, right, using that sort of grid to mark them in. And I'm then thinking, well, the sort of the, the sort of faint arms, the faint spiral arms extending out from the core. So I'm sw switching now from my propelling pencil to the HB pencil. They're sort of going up and down. So what's that sort of 10, 30, 11 o'clock down to sort of about 4, 30, 5 o'clock, that sort of angle there. It's just going to stop at this star and down towards this star. And then with the pencil and the blending stamp, I slowly start adding in the sort of faint needle-like arms that come off of that. And the other point as well, as I was mentioning earlier, using that little eraser shield, just to mark in the center line of the galaxy, the, the dust lane. And rather than try and draw a little bit above, a little bit below, I just smudge the whole thing with my blending stump, put the eraser shield over it, and then you can just gently, literally very gently rub the eraser over the shield and start to remove that dust lane. So that's my pencil sketch. Yeah, just simple graphite pencils on to paper. The other thing I also do is sometimes forget to put the finish time on. So you just got to remember to do that as well. Otherwise, you know, you don't know how long it's taken to do that. So looking at my chart there, I started out at quarter past 11 and then finished, what's that sort of 10, 10 minutes later uh, to do that sketch. That's a 10 minute sketch to put that together. And I say, this is why my wife calls it dots to dots and smudges. It literally is what's that? One, two, three, eight dots and some smudges and a line and a little bit of rubbing out. So it's not a complicated drawing. Uh, it's not an engineering drawing. It's not a masterpiece, but it is a rendition of what I saw that night having gone through my dark adaptation process. So I've now got my sketch. What I sometimes like to do is turn it the other way around. So it's a sketch. Uh, you know, it's the correct way round. So we've recorded black on white and I'll just snap a picture of it with my iPhone, email the picture to myself, which is the first uh, picture on the left. The middle picture, I just adjust the levels, get, yeah, use the cloning tool, get rid of the, um, of, of the obvious errors there where I've smudged or my pencils rubbed in the wrong place. And then uh, the third picture there, I put it onto my observing form as I've got in Photoshop, add the dates, the times, and then I've got a record both in my hard copy in the pencil sketch and I've got an electronic copy then that I can share around as well. So it doesn't take particularly long and I and I've always take my hat off to the proper the proper images who, you know, to record the detail, you know, the multiple hour long exposures in different filters and different wavelengths, and then spent the next month processing it up. And I think that's probably taken well less than half an hour of observing time. 50 minutes to put the sketch together, 50 minutes to write it up afterwards to turn it into a, a JPEG. So let's see how well then that compares. Let's put it alongside Dave's sketch. And you can see 
one of the things I, I, I'm quite pleased about is I've got the dust lane on the right hand side, slight, ever so slightly angled. And I have got the dust lane on the right hand side, so I'm quite chuffed about that. I've got the arc of stars in roughly the right place. These two bright stars up at the top, I think, are off the field of view of, of Dave's uh, slightly narrow field of view. Uh, this star here is slightly in the wrong place. It should be a bit closer to the nucleus. So I'll probably give myself seven out of ten for that. Uh, it's not quite not quite spot on, but it's good enough. But most importantly, it's my memory. It's my sketch. It's my picture of what I saw on that night uh, and why I thoroughly enjoyed uh, observing it. What's interesting, of course, on Dave's picture, he's recorded many, many, many more faint stars than I've managed to see. So the camera does pick out a lot more, go a lot fainter than the eye can. And Dave's also recorded at top left that faint uh, galaxy as well, just at the end of the arc of stars. So I looked that up on Sky Safari, it's magnitude 14, so there's no way I was going to see that even with the, the C11. So it just highlights it with the camera, of course, you get to see a lot deeper, uh, a lot fainter. But there are literally, I would guess that there are literally thousands of galaxies, star clusters, what have you, that are in the reach of a, a small telescope. So although you're not going to reach down to 14th, 15th magnitude stuff that a camera can, there's still plenty, plenty of things to go out and have a look at. So that's the sketching methodology. Um, one of the other things I would just like to put up is a picture of the Pleiades that I made through my binoculars the other day. They're following that same methodology, starting with the framework stars, adding uh, fainter stars around it. But as you can imagine, this took uh, slightly longer to put together as well. And the so what I was having to do was break it up into zones. So I do sort of the top left, the middle, the bottom left, and down to the center. Uh, so you you know you but when you zone it all up, it, it doesn't take that long to do to put these together. You know, once with a bit of practice, a bit of time, and it's a very relaxing way to just spend time outside listening to the you know the owls going past and the nature as well. And looking at my notes here, then that took 45 minutes of careful placement. Oh, one other thing to say, when you're doing a big sketch like this, not so bad with the galaxy sketch, is if I'm right-handed, I always start top left and then move down to bottom right. And that way you're not putting your wrist then on top of the sketch and then, and then smudging it. Of course, if you're left-handed, you would go top right to bottom left. So make sure you're always resting your arm on sort of the, the bits you haven't drawn on yet. So having talked about the mechanics of putting together a sketch and how to put together a deep sky observation, I'm now going to talk about why uh, I enjoy deep sky observing and, and sort of give an illustrated example. Uh, so this is back in 2006, I put this sketch together and it's the Andromeda Galaxy. So although I started observing a few years before, I never really got sort of properly keen into it, you know, sort of practical observing with, I don't know, university and trying to start a career and then try and start a family. And we went out to, um, on a family holiday out to Portugal, out to the Algarve, and I took my binoculars with me and put this sketch together. And I was properly dark adapted after a good long observing session. And it's quite interesting to see if I turn this over. And that was the finished sketch there. So I recorded the bright core inside the center of the galaxy. There's this sort of wider rugby ball shape as well, which is sort of the core, the, I don't know what you call that, there's a nucleus and then the core of the galaxy, but also this much longer, fainter uh, spiral arms of the galaxy. And I always find it quite interesting because if you think about it, the Andromeda galaxy is canted over at an angle. So if we look at one side, you know, if we look to the lower edge of the galaxy, for example. You're going quite faint, Mark. Oh, have, I, have you lost me? Am I still here? You're still there, but your, your volume of your voice is diminishing. Oh dear, I need another gin and that's tonic it. then, I think, Dave. <laughs> Maybe my microphone wandered off then. Thank you for that. So, yes, yeah, so, uh, when you look at this field of view, this is one of the sort of philosophical things. When I take my telescope into a school, those stars in the field of view are the foreground stars in our Milky Way. So they're probably a few hundred light years away at the most. So that's yeah, 400, light, 400 light years away. The galaxy itself is two million light years away. So you're actually going to see time travel in the eyepiece. And even when you look at the Andromeda galaxy, because it's canted at an angle, the light from one side to the other is actually younger. So the light from the far side of the galaxy, the northern end, is actually older from the light at the front side. You've also got two spiral, uh, two satellite galaxies, M32, the one closer, and M110, the one that's further away as well. And 
just to say from reading through some of those books, M110, M110, wasn't added to the Messier catalogue until 1967. Because if you, I don't know if you remember back in that picture we had earlier of Charles Messier, he actually had noted it, but hadn't put it in his catalogue. So it's sort of posthumously added in to his observing catalogue. It's also the only dwarf spher spheroidal galaxy in the entire Mes Messier catalogue orbiting this galaxy. So even through a humble pair of binoculars, we can put together some nice images, nice sketches, and uh, have three galaxies in the field of view. So then with the borrowed 10 inch reflector. Mark, can yep. I ask a question? Yeah, so far away, far away, please. Yeah, so with binoculars, do you have them mounted or are they handheld? They were, and I don't know if you remember, the, I had a mirror mount. I got a picture somewhere, but I don't think I got it in the slide pack. And I made many years ago, I bought a first surface mirror. And it's one of those little wooden contraptions. You have the binoculars looking down into the mirror and you can then tilt tilt the, uh, the mirror upwards. I really recommend mounting binoculars because if you want to do a sketch, of course you have to put your binoculars down to get your charts out and get your notebook out. And having them handheld means it, it makes that process so much harder. So I'd always re recommend having a mounted pair of binoculars. It just makes it so much easier to do, to do astronomy with. Of course, if you're just going out to look, then it, you know that, that, that argument is moot. But if you want to make a sketch and you know, get star charts out and get notebooks out, then yeah, always have them mounted. And that was on the mirror, and the mirror mount. Did I have that in my notes? Uh, I don't think I made it. Oh, yes, 15 by 70 binoculars on a mirror mount from Algarve in the Portugal. Did that answer your question? Yes, uh, now you mentioned it, I do, do remember you. Yeah, sure. I'll see if I can dig out a picture afterwards or something of like that. Okay, so that's a view through a pair of binoculars then of the Andromeda Galaxy. And then we're going to jump up in aperture out to a 10 inch reflector. This was a borrowed 10 inch reflector, a Dobsonian, so undriven telescope. And this is a higher magnification view at 55 times power. And you can see then we've zoomed right into the galaxy. We've got, uh, let's have a look then. So we've got the bright core at top right, what we could see in the earlier. We've got these dark dust lanes sort of sweeping right to left. So you can actually see the dust lanes as well. We've got M32, the satellite galaxy, just off um, the top part of the galaxy. And I always look at this, whenever I see a picture of the Andromeda Galaxy, there are two stars alongside M32, just to the right hand side. And if you go from the top star to the bottom star, roughly, not quite, takes you to this little star cloud. And that is a bit like in our own Milky Way, a, you know, a star cloud that you see, you know, those pictures of the Milky Way with all the dust lanes and star clouds. That's a star cloud in another galaxy. That is NGC 206, which was inevitably discovered by William Herschel. Uh, back in the day when he was scanning uh, scanning the sky. And so you say this is a 10 inch telescope. It's not a particularly big telescope, you know, quite affordable, particularly if you went second hand, undriven Dobsonian. And yet with that, you can actually see star clouds and observe them firsthand in another galaxy. And whenever I see a picture now of M32, because I've got that, because I found it, I had to go and look for it. And I knew it was roughly if you follow those two stars next to it, uh, M32, that's how you find NGC 206. So there's a gal galactic nucleus, satellite galaxy, the two spiral arms or the, or the gaps between the spiral arms, and then NGC 206, the OB uh, star cloud in the Andromeda galaxy. So again, getting to a slightly bigger telescope, I used to have a 14 inch Dobsonian. Um, and then when I built the observatory, I then realized it couldn't see over the, the uh, walls of the observatory. So that's when I changed over to the C11. So this is just in the garden. And uh, I, I, I'd forgotten that I made this observation on, on Christmas day on, or Christmas day evening on the 25th of December, 2014. And I'd read in Cloudy Nights about how easy it is, relatively easy, I should say, to find the brightest globular cluster in the Andromeda galaxy, which is called Mayo 2 or G1, which I think is just because it's the brightest globular G1. And I used my 50 millimeter Teleview Plossel, which was a second-hand Plossel. I think I bought it for about 50 pounds. So quite, again, relatively cheap. Star hopped from M32 and found this globular cluster in another galaxy. 
Uh, and I say this is what I find amazing about astronomy, and we're so fortunate to to have a hobby that allows us to do this. But we can actually go and see our targets firsthand. You know, we're not relying on studying things in museum or reading reading about them in literature. We can actually we're actually lucky that we can go out and see these things firsthand. Um, and then reading about it in the in some of the deep sky observing books I've got, they think that actually this may not be a globular cluster. It is part of the M31 Andromeda galaxy, but it could be the core of one of these dwarf galaxies that's been ripped to shreds as it's passed through the Andromeda galaxy. It's been cannibalized by its uh, by the galaxy itself. And that's the core that's just been left behind. It's lost all its outer layers, etc. And then it's that's all that's just left is that it's a bit like a that little granular little clump and what I did there was downloaded a deep sky survey image. And again, quite chuffed about that. I have to orientate it just to get to run to my field of view. But again, just with the pencil, I've got the it's a bit like Mickey Mouse. You've got the circular bit and two ears. And then you've got the three stars, one and the little double star on those ones there. So just with pencil and paper, obviously a bigger telescope, the 14 inch. I've gone all the way from binoculars, being able to see the galaxies and the field stars up to seeing features within the galaxy itself, up to being able to see a globular cluster inside the Andromeda galaxy. And I think that's why I really love visual observing of, of deep sky objects. You get to see these things firsthand, uh, you know, with a simple setup, you can get to see those, these little objects. So I hope that's helped explain then, that's why I enjoy the simplicity and beauty of observing the deep sky and building that sort of personal relationship with the most distant objects we can see. And so having that notebook and those sketches brings back memories of further observing projects over the years. And I hope it encourages us as well to, you know, to get off the beaten track and start exploring the observable universe, be it with binoculars, be it with a telescope or be it with a camera. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions.